We are at lecture 20 of securities regulation and um, we are in the middle of our DRHP for Burger King. We've covered the risk factors in the previous lecture and now we'll just go ahead with the rest of the, the draft red herring perspective. So following the risk factors chapter, you'll have a, you'll have a section um, on introducing the company. And to begin with, we'll talk about the offer, of course, the number of equity shares in this particular draft red herring prospectus hasn't been defined yet but we know that it's a 6-2 issue which means that um, the QIB portion will be not less than 75% of the total number of um, shares offered which is a combination of a fresh issue as well as the 60 million equity shares. Right so um, most of this is blank but you'll notice that the offer table includes exact number of shares for the QIB portion of which you could carve out a bit for anchor investors. Um, again, within the anchor investor portion, you can carve out a bit for mutual funds and non-mutual fund anchor investors. Um, you'll also have um, the exact number of shares for the high net worth individuals as well as for retail investors, right? Um, a pre and post comparison or in terms of equity shares, we have about 266 million equity shares outstanding or issued or part, or part of the paid up share capital of the company. That, that will obviously increase because we have uh, a fresh issue of shares aggregating up to 4,000 million, 4 billion shares or 400 crores, um, you know, as part of this offer as well, right? Um, so... That is followed by a summary of financial information, which really we don't have to take care of. Um, this is again provided by the the um, the auditors, and I'm simply going to skip this because we really have nothing to do with this at all. Um, let's skip all of this and come to general information. Now, this is general information about the offer. Um, mostly around the company, of course, but there will be some other information about the offer and, and who are the merchant bankers, who are the auditors, and so on and so forth, right? So we were incorporated as Burger King India Private Limited in, to, in 2013. Uh, subsequently, in, 20, in, in, in sometime in 2019, uh, we, were, um, we, was, we, we were converted into a public limited company and the word private was struck off. A fresh certificate of incorporation was issued by the ROC recording the change of, of, of the name of the company um, to Burger King India Limited. Now, so here we have the corporate office. It's somewhere in Mumbai and we've obviously filed it with the Mumbai office of SEBI. Because our registered office is um, in Mumbai, um, we, are we are obviously subject to Mumbai jurisdiction for the registrar of companies. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight directors, of which two of them are already independent directors. Now, mind you, this is probably in preparation for the company going private, uh, sorry, for the company going, uh, going public. Um, and if you will recall from your basic understanding of company law, if your chairman is an independent director, then only one third of your board needs to be um, independent. So we've got three out of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight directors um, as as independent, which means that they've already met the uh, independent directors requirements and norms uh, for public listed companies in India. Right. So we've got three independent directors, Shiv Kumar, Kolaya Dega, Sandeep Chaudhary and, and, and Tara Subramaniam. Um, I'm guessing that this is a lady director, uh, which also meets the the female director, a female independent director requirement for listed companies. Uh, the rest um, I'm given to understand are all whole time directors or non exec or or non executive directors. Um, the CEO would have probably been the um, the former chairman, and we'll note that with effect from October 17, 2019, um, you've got Shiv Kumar Pulaya Dega as chairman, right? And the rest, Ajay Kaul, Amit Minocha, Jaspal Singh, Sab Singh Sabarwal, and Peter Perdue, these would have been um, nominated by our, our promoter, right? 
the details of the company secretary and compliance officer, a lady known as Ranjana, I'm assuming this is a lady, Ranjana Sabu, um, who are the statutory auditors of the company, SRBC and Company Limited, L sorry, uh, LLP. Um, this is, of course, an affiliate of Ernst & Young, fairly well known in Mumbai. Uh, there have been no changes in the auditors in the last three years. Now, who are the book running lead managers or the merchant bankers to this issue? You've got Kotak, CLSA, uh, which is part of Credit Lyon um, Securities Asia, um, Edelweiss, JM Financial. Um, yeah, so these four are our um, merchant bankers, all of them fairly well known, fairly good at what they do. Legal counsel. Legal counsel is Cyril Amarchand Mangadash to uh, the company. For the book running lead managers, uh, for the merchant bankers, it's Luther and formerly known as Luther and Luther, now LNL partners. Good to see them getting some top quality work as well. Uh, there's got we've got uh, foreign foreign lawyers as well, Ashurst, which is known to have a very strong India desk, um, particularly for Indian capital markets. And uh, and Cyril Amartan Mangandas is also advising the promoter selling shareholder as to Indian law. So this is a fairly fairly good sort of lineup of law firms. Uh, you've got you've got Cam, you've got LNL, you've got Asher. So this is obviously fairly well known. The registrar to the offer is Link in Time. Uh, again, fairly well known. Uh, the company uses ICICI Bank, HDFC, Yes Bank, and Kotak. And you'll notice that even though Kotak is a banker to the company, which means that the company probably takes loans from them or has an account with them, you'll notice that the person who is in charge of, uh, you know, Kotak Mahindra as the book running lead manager, that's Ganesh Rane, and this, and this merchant bank is Kotak Mahindra Capital Company Limited, as opposed to Kotak Mahindra Bank Limited, and they're represented by Sudha Balakrishnan, right? So, there would probably be an information firewall between Kotak Mahindra Bank Limited and Kotak Mahindra um, Capital Company Limited. Now, these kind of situations where the merchant bank and the banker to the company are somehow related, it makes for some very interesting case studies, as we'll see later on during our, um, our module on insider trading. All right, let's continue with general information. Um, you have something called self-certified syndicate banks and their branches. These are banks that have been notified by SEBI to, to receive bids and applications um, on behalf of the merchant banks, on behalf of the registrar, on behalf of the company, right? So, um, so any of these bids that have been put in by by retail investors, by quibs, apart from anchor investors, um, can be submitted to a member of the syndicate, uh, which is basically a consortium of banks, uh, a group of banks that have been authorized by SEBI to receive deposits of bidcom application forms, right? Um, you can put in your application to a registered broker with SEBI, as well as registrar and the share transfer agents, right? There have been no experts to the offer except for the statutory auditors. Um, in addition, the company has also engaged Technopack to figure out where this industry of quick service restaurants is headed. Um, again, we are not really we are not really concerned with this much because you know, um, in terms of what the industry standards are or where the industry is moving, is not really relevant from the legal perspective, right? Um, it's important to take a look at the interse allocation of responsibilities. Now, of all the banks, of all the merchant banks that have that have come in, uh, you know, Kotak, JM Financial, CLSA, and Ilvice, um, all of them have specific responsibilities. Now, in this table of interse allocation of responsibilities, the responsibility for each of these activities lies with all of the book running lead managers, all of the merchant banks, but one person really takes the full responsibility or the responsibility for coordination, right? So in terms of um, the draft red heading prospectus, in terms of the due diligence of the company, um, etc., it'll be Kotak. So they will probably be working very closely with CAM and LNL to conduct the due diligence and the content for the disclosures 
for the draft redheading prospectus, right? Kotak will also take a look at all the advertising um, that will go out while this company is in the process of the IPO. Any and all publicity material other than the statutory ad ad advertisement uh, will be look will be looked after by by JM Financial. Appointment of intermediaries will be looked after by Kotak. CLSA will handle the roadshow um, and the international marketing. So because CLSA is a, a, a Hong Kong based um, a Hong Kong based merchant banker, um, they would probably have better contacts. They'll probably have better network, better reach in international markets, uh, which means that CLSA then takes care of the international marketing. Domestic marketing is with Kotak, uh, retail marketing is with Edelweiss, and uh, non-institutional marketing, so, so high net worth individuals, marketing to with JM Financial, and JM Financial will also look after the stock exchanges, compliance with SEBI, uh, and so on and so forth, right? All right. Um, this part is fairly standard um, and fairly self-explanatory. I'm going to skip all of this. Um, a slight word on underwriting um, after the determination of the offer price, but before we file the prospectus, the promoter and the selling shareholder will enter into an underwriting agreement with the underwriters. Um, the lead merchant bankers, the, the, the book running lead managers, will be responsible for bringing in the amount devolved in the event that syndicate members, the um, the people who are supposed to be underwriting, do not fulfill their underwriting obligations, right? All right. Um, and that's it on general information. Let's move on to capital structure. Now, the capital structure chapter is the first major chapter that capital markets lawyers pretty much deal with, right? So we know what the authorized share capital of the company is. This will be mentioned in the memorandum and articles of association of the company. Um, we know what the paid up share capital of the company is. This will be based on the annual returns filed by the company as well as the um, return of allotment or PAS forms that would have been filed by the company. Right. So we know that this company, Burger King, has... 266 odd million equity shares and about 10 million equity shares, uh, sorry, 10 million con con compulsorily convertible preference shares, right? Um, again, the present offer in terms of this draft red heading prospectus is still open. We don't really know how many equity shares, but we do know that the fresh issue will account for 4 billion rupees and 600 million shares will be offered as a pure offer for sale, making it a composite issue. Now, um, take a look at the notes. So now we'll have to take a look at the, the notes to the capital structure. And this is where it really becomes important for us in terms of our diligence, right? So the share capital history of the company. So how many shares have we allotted? On what date? To whom? What was the nature of allotment? So either it's an initial subscription or a further allotment. How many shares have been allotted? What was the face value? the issue price and whether this was for cash or other than cash, right? So this, this information you'll find in the return of allotment. Every time there's, there are shares that are being issued, there is a return of allotment filed with the ROC. Additionally, you would also have in a real life, in a real life diligence, you would also have the, um, the, the board minutes, so every time there's an issue of shares, there would be board minutes, there would be a special resolution passed by shareholders, there would be share certificates that would have been handed out. So you would have the opportunity to diligence all of these documents in a real diligence. However, in your regular DRHB assignment, you'll have to rely only on the ROC filings. So we note that um, there have been plenty of shares that have been issued over time between November 2013 and March 2017. We also note that there have been um, an employee stock option scheme dated, to, dated 2015. These stock options were probably were, were exercised um, were exercised sometime in 2019 um, in June and August. So you'll have instead of a rights issue and of equity shares, you'll have an allotment person to the uh, employee stock option scheme to 2015. And this would be an allotment not for cash, 
this would be an allotment for other than cash right all right uh pre preference share capital um again same thing with as with the equ equity shares um how many preference shares have been allotted when were they allotted was it for cash or for something other than cash um so take a look at this asterisk so this part really is an explanatory statement for the ccps so there are 10 million outstanding ccps currently held by qsr asia rate of dividend is eight percent per annum this will be convertible at the discretion of the preference shareholder within a period of 20 years at the fair market value obviously we can't have put uh, we, we can't have a conversion based on a fixed uh, fixed market price right uh, so this will be based on fair market value on the date of conversion and the fair market value shall be determined at, at the date of conversion in accordance with applicable law by a valuation expert right um, subject to a minimum price of 36.28 rupees for the conversion of the CCPS on the conversion date. These uh, CCPS will be converted into equity on or prior to filing the deadheading prospectus with the Registrar of Companies. Now, take a look at how the disclosures are being made. Except as disclosed below, our company has not issued any equity shares or preference shares. Right. So these are in the nature of negative disclosures as well. So uh, we have we have made allotments pursuant to our employee stock option scheme and we've mentioned the number of equity shares allotted and the face value. Right. Our company has not issued or allotted any equity shares pursuant to any scheme of arrangement um, except for the allotment of equity shares uh, pursuant to the em employee stock option scheme. We have not issued any equity shares that may be at a price lower than the offer price during a period of one year preceding the date of this draft red herring prospectus, right? So with that, we come to the end. Oh, no, we don't. Hang on, sorry. So then we take a look at the shareholding pattern of the company. Now, this is as per clause 35 of the former, former listing agreement with the Bombay Stock Exchange. This basically breaks down your shareholding between promoter and promoter group, public, non-promoter, non-public, um, shares held by employees and shares held by held under under depository receipts. So we've got a few um, public shareholders already. These are the employees of the company who would have received shares through the employee stock option scheme. And the remainder is held by the vast majority is held by um, the promoter and the promoter group. Right. Again, this will come out as uh, a calculation based on your understanding of how many shares have been allotted to whom, right? Other details of the shareholding of the company. How many shareholders do you have as on date? Um, a list of shareholders holding 1% or more. Uh, a list of shareholders holding 1% or more as of 10 days prior to the, dread, to the draft red heading prospectus and one year prior to the draft red heading prospectus, right? Um, and of course, one percent or more of the paid off share capital of the company as of two years prior. So what we're trying to do through these number of of um, of tables is to show to the public, is to show to the reader that who has been holding more than one percent of the paid off share capital of the company for different periods of time. All right. Uh, most of these are in the nature of negative um, negative disclosures, so except for the allotment of equity shares, person to the fresh issue, um, and the ESOS, the Employee Stock Option Scheme, we do not intend to propose or alter our capital uh, for a period of six months from the bid offer opening date. Right. So these are a number of statements that are going to be made by the company, um, which will depend upon what you find out through your diligence, right? Details of our shareholding, of the shareholding of the promoter and other members of the promoter group. If you're confused about what is promoter group, take a look at the definition of promoter group in, um, in the ICDR, uh, Regulation 2. And again, because this is mostly held by QSR Asia, this is fairly simple. Uh, we have to disclose again the number of equity shares, percentage, and post offer. We still don't know, so these are remaining as blobs. Right. How did the promoter build up its shareholding in the company? Again, this is effectively a copy paste job from earlier um, tables. So which means that this particular 
that this particular table, which is the buildup of the entire equity share capital of the company, um, uh, is really, really important. And what you could do is possibly, you know, keep this handy, make sure that this um, make sure that this table is 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 absolutely correct, is, is absolutely accurate and that you can rely upon this at any point of time. All right, let's move on ahead. Um, so, yeah, build up of the promoter shareholding and build up of the preference shareholding of our promoter, right? A confirmation that none of our equity shares or preference shares held by a promoter are pledged. Details of any members of the promoter group, so that's F&B Singapore. They hold one equity share. All right. Um, we do have a positive um, disclosure that the promoter's contribution, which is that 20% of the fully diluted post offer equity share capital of the company, shall be locked in for a period of three years. Um, and anything in excess of that 20% shall be locked in for a period of one year. So this goes back to our concept of lock-in, which you already know. Um, depending upon how many shares are sold um, and what is the percentage of the post-issue paid-up share capital, this table will be filled in at a later date. Um, the rest isn't really important. This is all standard language. Uh, again, feel free to take a look at it or, or go through it in some detail. Uh, on your own. Anchor investors, if any, shall be locked in for a period of 30 days. Um, that's the only other lock-in apart from the promoter that we'll have. And um, right, so again, these are, these are all standard disclosures that are required to be made under the ICDR. Please check whether your company um, has any such, any, any issues which would change these disclosures. Other than that, this is a fairly clean company and therefore, um, you know, this could be a standard copy-paste job as well. Now, they do have an employee stock option scheme. Now, the um, uh, so there will be a detailed disclosure on what the employee stock option scheme was like. So, um, the objective was to attract and retain talent um, and to motivate our employees to contribute to the overall corporate growth of the program. Um, now, there, presently, the stock option scheme has set aside some 11 million shares, which can be, which can, which can vest later on. After the vesting of options, the employees earn a right, but not an obligation, to exercise the vested options, effectively to convert their options into shares, um, within a period of three years, right? Um, upon the upon the exercise of one vested option, employees can obtain one equity share, right? So, which means that for every option um, that has been granted or vested in a particular employee, I, th that employee will be able to get one equity share. So, how many have we granted so far? We've granted around 10, a little less than 11 million options, um, of which you've got about 1.6 million um, shares that have already, or options that have already been converted. And the total number of equity shares that would arise as a result, if, if this entire number of options were vested, that would be 8.6 million. So at some point of time, we may expect that 8.6 million shares may be issued as part of the um, employee stock option scheme. Right. Um, this is pretty much. This is not. Um, this is not really relevant for us, uh, except to to show who has the option. So the chief, the CEO, and the whole time director, the chief financial officer, chief of business development, chief people officer. I'm assuming this is a new age, newfangled way to say head of HR, uh, the compliance officer, and. Oh, this, the present CFO and the former CFO. All right. So we've had a change of CFO in 2019. That's interesting. All right. Um, most of this is not relevant for us. I'm going to skip through and we'll come to the objects of the offer. 
Um, so we'll stop here for now and in the next lecture we can start the objects of the offer.